sections about capacitors and capacitance. Uh, first thing we've got to do is work out what uh, is a capacitor. Then we've got to talk about how they work and we've got to define this quantity called capacitance. Okay, So it's a bit like having a resistor and resistance. We've got a thing that's called capacitors and we need to define this quantity which we call capacitance. So we need to start off by just getting our heads very clearly around the idea of what a capacitor does and how it works. Um, one of the first things that you ever did when you were in sort of year five or year six maybe, you would have said that unless there's a complete circuit, you can't get an electric current flowing. Okay, so but but think about what you know you know about electricity now. Why is it? Why is it that if you haven't got a complete circuit, a light bulb, for example, won't light up? Well, hopefully this little model will give us an idea. Here's our circuit. Um, obviously we've got a gap here, so the electrons can't just flow around. But how do the electrons up here know that? Well, what happens in an electric circuit is each electron pushes the one in front of us. Okay, this is a simplification, of course, but each electron pushes the one in front of it, and they all move. When that happens, think about what's going to happen down here. Well, if this is a very big gap, then these electrons over here aren't really affected by these electrons over here. But if that's a small gap, okay, what can happen is this. The electrons start to flow, okay, because they're getting sort of pushed, if you like, from over here at the battery. We do get a little bit of a flow of um, charge through the ammeter, so it does measure a small current for a while. But what's going to happen is these electrons can't get out at the end of this wire and jump across to this side, so they sort of build up a little bit at this point. These electrons all start repelling each other, so they start pushing back. Okay, So if you're an electron in the middle here somewhere, you're being pushed this way by the battery, but you're being pushing, pushed back that way by these electrons building up at the end here. Okay, When those two forces become equal, then the electrons stop flowing and there's no current anymore. Right, But there is a little bit of a build-up of charge over here, and because of this build-up of a negative charge here, it pushes the electrons off this end, so we do get a little bit of a current flowing all the way around the circuit. But that current only flows for a very short amount of time, and it's a very small current, Okay, because very quickly we get a build-up of charge here, which stops the current flowing by opposing the force that was making the electrons flow in the first place. Okay, So the electrons push each other around the circuit, Across a small gap, the electrons can push the ones away on the other side when there's a build-up of charge. But eventually, when the electrons build up at that end, they repel, so they've pushed backwards. And when the voltage from these pushing backwards is equal to the voltage of the battery pushing clockwise in this circuit, then there'll be no more current to flow. Okay, so that doesn't really tell us much about capacitance, um, but imagine this circuit. Okay, what happens if we still have the same kind of setup, but what we've got here is a much bigger area um, of two plates. So here's our same circuit, but we've got two big plates. They start off with electrons on both sides. We connect the circuit. What's going to happen? Okay, well, the electrons start to flow around, okay, until these electrons here, over a much bigger area, okay, this whole plate here, have built up enough push, enough push back to stop them flowing around, okay? Because there's a big negative charge on this plate, they've pushed all the electrons off this plate over here. So this plate has become negatively charged, this plate has become positively charged, and at this point, the electrons are now, no more electrons are flowing around the circuit, okay? So the current is now zero because the voltage here pushing back is equal to the voltage of the supply. But what you'll be able to see, hopefully, is we've stored a lot more charge on here than we did first time. So the bigger the area of this capacitor here, the more charge that we can actually put onto the plate, Okay, so the more charge we can store. And that's basically what a capacitor is. It's just a way of storing electrons on a plate, Okay, which can later be flow back off that plate around a circuit. Okay, so same kind of idea, just more electrons because of the area they can spread out over. Okay, here's a little model to help us with that. Okay, so one way we can think of a capacitor is going back to the water model. Okay, we don't talk about the water model very much. I'm not a big fan of it for most explanations of electricity. I think it causes some confusions, but it is quite a handy model for capacitors. So what you can think of as a capacitor as being like a box with a rubber membrane across the middle of it. Okay, the water can't pass through the box because of the rubber membrane, 
but the membrane is flexible. So the harder you push the water in one side, the more the membrane stretches. And when the membrane stretches, it pushes water out the other side of the box. Okay, so here's our diagram for this. Okay, this is uh, what Einstein didn't do anything about capacitors, but he called this a thought experiment. So we're not actually going to do this. Okay, we're just going to give the idea. So we've got a pump here. We've got something to measure the flow of water around the system. And crucially, we've got a box here, and the box has got some water in it. This is water, the same both sides. You wouldn't know the difference in the water. We've just coloured it in so you can see it. And across the middle of the box here is a membrane, okay, made of rubber so that it can stretch. Okay, if you don't turn the pump on, then the membrane just stays in its sort of natural position. But when you turn the pump on, the pump pushes the water around the box, around the uh, system. So the water in this case is going this way around the system. Okay, water can flow into the box and water can flow out of the box. So this red water that was here, this area of water here, okay, has come in from this side and the same amount of water has gone out from that side. The water flows, of course, the rate of water flowing will get less as you fill the box up because the more the membrane stretches, the more it's pushing back. And eventually the circuit stop, the water stops flowing around the, the system at all because the membrane here is pushing back with the same force that the pump is trying to push the water around with. Okay, now you don't need to understand this model um, for the exams or anything, but if you've got this kind of idea in your head, I think this will give you quite a good idea, quite a good understanding of how a capacitor works in a circuit, okay? Um, first thing we probably should just go through is what everything's standing for in the circuit so the pump is like the battery in a system the flow meter we might get the clue from that is an ammeter okay so it's measuring how much um, water is going through every second if you like the box with the membrane is the capacitor the water is the charge the rate of flow of water is the current the stretch meter okay measuring how much the rubber has stretched inside the capacitor or inside the box Okay, that's like a voltmeter. The water that's in the stretch part, so not all the water, remember the box starts with water in it already, but the extra water that's um, on one side rather than the other, okay, that's the amount of charge we've stored. Okay, and then crucially, the water stored in the stretch part per unit of stretch applied, that's what we're going to call the capacitance, okay, so we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, but something to understand here is that um, the capacitance doesn't tell you how much charge is stored it only tells you how much charge you can store for every volt you apply if the water stopped flowing around the circuit and we said oh that's that's um, completed now the box is as carrying as much water as it can that's not true because if i got a more powerful pump then i'd be able to push more water into the stored part of the box okay so here's an equivalent um circuit a real experiment okay we've got our capacitor this is the symbol for the capacitor here we've got a 10,000 ohm resistor we've got a milliameter um, because the currents are going to be fairly small in these sort of circuits and we want to get a graph of current against time okay if you've understood the thought experiment there then you might understand hopefully that as time goes by the current is going to decrease Okay, when we start off, we've got 6 volts here and we've got 10,000 ohms. So we can work out the initial current because the capacitor is doing nothing at all. The current is the voltage divided by the resistance, which is 6 volts over 10,000 ohms, okay, which is 0 0.6 milliamps of current. Okay, It wouldn't matter what the capacitance was. But then after a while, let's suppose when that is 6 volts and we've got 3 volts here pushing back, Okay, then the current will only be 0 0.3 milliamps and so on. Okay, so the current isn't going to be constant. The current is going to decrease as time goes by. Okay, you can do this experiment in class, but I can show you a little animation of this. First thing to notice is that you need to make sure the capacitor's got no charge on it before you start, because if you just leave a capacitor with charge on it, the charge has got nowhere to go. It'll stay there. So the way we do that is just to short it out. So if I just connect those two sides together, then I can be sure that this capacitor has now got no charge on it. What I can then do is connect this circuit together. So I'll close this switch. I need to unpause the animation. Notice that we start here at 0 0.6 milliamps because that was 6 volts divided by 10 kilo ohms. 
Okay, the charge is building upon the capacitor and this kind of animation it looks like it's already completely charged but trust me there's more charge building upon this capacitor because the electrons are flowing around the circuit. Here's our current, okay, this is measuring in microamps. So we started at 600 microamps but we're going down and down and down because as the charge builds up on here this is starting to push back. Okay, so we've now got some, we've still got charge going around the circuit but we've got the capacitor trying to reduce that charge. So I miss a bit out there, save you just waiting and watching it, but here, here we are after 60 seconds. Okay, we've got a graph of the charge against time, and the question is how can we work out, sorry, the current against time. The question is how can we work out how much charge we've stored on the capacitor? Okay, well we could do some complicated math on this that we'll look at later on, but the simple way for us to do it is to remember the equation Q equals IT. So every one of these boxes, excuse me, Every one of these boxes represents a certain amount of current for a certain amount of time. So if we look at it on here, um, to be a little bit simpler. Okay, if we look at one of these boxes, this box is a current of 0 0.1 milliamps and a time of 20 seconds. So to work out the charge stored in that box, all I have to do is... Um, Q equals IT is 0 0.1 milliamps times 20 seconds, which is 2 millicoulombs of charge. Once I've done that, I've just got to count the boxes. Okay, the normal way we do this is we count, um, if it's less than half, we don't count it. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, um, a bit tricky that one, 11, 12, 13 maybe okay maybe that one 14 let's call that 14 I think we probably shouldn't have counted that one so 13 um, lots of 2 millicoulombs means that this capacitor has stored 26 millicoulombs of charge okay now obviously this graph goes on forever so there is a lot more charge over under here but surprisingly even though this axis will go to infinity without this getting to zero the extra charge here is can be fairly uh, negligible so we've got a fairly good estimate for the total charge that's stored okay so our last thing was to talk about what this define this quantity called capacitance which is measured in these units called farads okay and it's a measure of how well the capacitor stores charge so remember there's two things that affect how much charge a capacitor will store uh, one thing is its capacitance and the other thing is how many volts you apply across it okay it's a little bit um, analogous to thinking about how much current will flow through a resistor there's two things that matter aren't there the current that flows through a resistor depends on the voltage but it also depends on the resistance okay the charge we store on a capacitor depends on the capacitance but it also depends on the voltage okay so this quantity called capacitance is Q over V okay how many coulombs of charge do I get for every volt I apply to it because for any capacitor the more voltage I apply the more charge I'm going to store so to make a kind of fair comparison we need to know the amount of charge I store per volt that I apply Okay, so that's this equation, charge is capacitance times voltage. So in the example we did, um, I had um, C equals Q over V. So I had 26 millicoulombs, 26 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. For my 6 volts that I'd applied, okay, that's 4.3 times 10 to the minus 3 farads, or 4.3 millifarads. That would be the value of the capacitance. Okay, it means I will get 4.3 millicoulombs of charge for every volt that I apply. Okay, one farad equals one coulomb per volt.